I'm extremely interested for reasons that we will, uh, that I'll talk to you about that so many of you placed this quote around the 2000s because in fact it got resurrected around then. I started teaching it again exactly in 2004-ish, but it comes to us from, nobody got it quite right, but some of you were closer. This is a quote from Patterns of Culture by Ruth Benedict that was first published in 1934. So this actually, uh, she didn't know it, it was between the wars. It was after what they called the Great War, what we now call World War I, but nobody really at the time thought there was gonna be World War II, so they called it the Great War. Some people called it the First World War, not expecting for a second one. But, you know, you can kind of tell this is, this is talking about the rise of kind of uh, various regimes in Europe and the kind of stuff that was going on in Germany at the time. Um, I think, Sarah, that you're right. It is, does refer to that kind of colonial imperial mentality. So I don't want to, I don't want to count that one out either. But it's from what, quite a long time ago, yet to me, and I'm, like I said, I'm interested that you think it's around the 2000s or that time because it comes back to us for that. So we'll, we will come back to why, why that happened and why Ruth Benedict and this idea comes back to us from the 1930s into the present. Today, we read about the issue, chapter three, the issue of race and ethnicity. And so I want to talk about how we classify, how we have classified people and the idea of biological race, where that originates from. And then we'll talk about uh, some of these lessons from the 1930s until the 2000s and now. So this is a map of what are called skin color variations where people would go around with little tabs and measure usually on the inside of people's arms because you're less likely to be dramatically exposed to the sun to try and figure out your variation from one to 30 in terms of skin color. And uh, this is, uh, this is a map of the skin colors that would have been of the people who lived in these geographical areas in around 1492. And you can see here that there is a, you know, the darker skin colors are in the tropics and the lighter skin colors are in the Northern hemisphere and for a far Southern hemisphere. Why is this, Juliana? Why do people even have different skin colors? Yeah, that's uh, that's a good good sentence. It's basically a a natural selection evolutionary mechanism. There's been some debate about why exactly this occurs and how, and there's different genetic mechanisms and there's different uh, distributions for sun protection. And But vitamin D absorption seems to have a lot to do with this. It actually emerged fairly recently in human history. So maybe within the last 50 or 60,000 years, maybe even less. Uh, so it's a relatively uh, recent trait. Um, Homo sapiens emerge in Africa. That is the birthplace of almost all Homo evolution. And for those of you who've been with me in intro or prof with Professor Sugandi or with Professor Anderson in biological anthropology, know that there were other types of homo creatures running around back then. We have Denisovans and Neanderthals and now Homo naledi and all different, a pretty wide range of variation back then. 
But when it comes to Homo sapiens, Mickey, what do we know about our own kind? Genetically speaking, as in compared to those, compared to that wide range we had back in the day. Yeah, the Homo sapiens are the, we're the last remaining species and all these other groups kind of went away. So back in the day, there was a lot more genetic variation. In today's world, we're a very uniform genetically species. We're very much the same. To the extent that there is genetic diversity, we can find it in Africa. As Gonzalez notes on page 54, almost all of human genetic diversity can be found within, still within the continent of Africa. And the people in Eurasia and in the Americas are basically just a subset of that greater genetic diversity which happened in, within Africa. But again, it's not a huge amount of diversity. Now, before people started moving around on sailing across the ocean and getting on planes, people of course moved slowly, they moved, and they traveled a lot and people have always been migrating and going back and forth and interbreeding and intermarrying and trading with each other. And if you got cut off from the human homo sapiens, you probably would die because you have to keep doing this kinds of things. But basically in the olden days, if you took a walk from the very Northern latitudes all the way down to the Southern latitudes, you would find what we call a clinal distribution of skin tone. But the skin tones would vary gradually all the way along the, that way. And sure, if you put somebody from here together with somebody from here, they would look very different, but there's no place along this walk, and you could take that walk from east to west or within even some places like India itself. There's no place at which you're like, aha, I've crossed the river, the river between the whites and the blacks. There's always going to be variation and villages uh, that would be basically the same. And as you go along these lines, the, the differences would become pronounced. So that applies both the east-west variation and the different processes that make, that make us call people Asians or Europeans. It actually applies uh, and later on, she talks about fair-skinned and darker-skinned people in India. So there's also phenotypic variation within the Indian subcontinent, as well as within Australia, as well as within the Americas. So people that came into the Americas, uh, some of them developed darker skin or maybe depigmented if they were in the north. It's hard to say whether this is a reaction after or before, but the point of the matter is all of this was gradual variation uh, from place to place. Now, everybody, how to say, we've always been interested in physical and biological differences. People have always looked around and noticed that people were of different heights, shapes, colors, and all kinds of things. But the idea that those should be grouped into races comes to us quite recently in human history. It comes to us from that colonial period that Sarah was talking to us about from the 1600s through the 1800s or the 1500s through the 1800s, if we want to be uh, perhaps more precise where people from certain areas of the world went to other areas of the world and then made people, shackled them and put them onto boats and transferred them over to other parts of the world and then made them all work next to each other on plantations and tried to organize what was a gradual diversity, this clinal variation, they tried to organize it according to the plantation and other labor systems of the new world, or the Americas, I should say, uh, into these kinds of blocks of people. And um, most of our racial categories in the United States are, are actually based on a very poor sample of human variation. For example, at that time, people from India or Australasia weren't even around very much in the Americas. And so they didn't really come into these original classification uh, schemes in 
uh, and especially in the United States. So it fell to people uh, or people like our famous Linnaeus, who gave us that genus species uh, designation that we still use today, uh, was one of the first Europeans to classify people into kinds or into different blocks of blocks of people. And his first classification, or he originally used six different human kinds, including wild man and monsters. And, you know, if you look back at some of the pictures and the descriptions of what he used for this, you'll realize that as Gonzalez states, did she say that he was relying on the sailors and that they were probably uh, the sailors who were drinking too much of the hard stuff. Which is to say he had these ideas of people that were part of humanity, maybe. So I guess I, I just want to point out that among the earliest classification schemes, we shouldn't just because we, we still have this idea from Linnaeus. We don't have the homo ferus and the homo monstrosus, but this idea is kind of stuck with us, uh, that there are people from the Americas, Native Americans, Asians, Africans, and Europeans, and he gave them colors. I don't know if you, I was taught a song in Sunday school you don't know this song? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. <laughs> Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. <laughs> You're waiting for that one. Yeah, it's kind of a, there's the colors right there, right in a row. They come to us from good old Linnaeus, and then he had a whole bunch of things to say about the people. So I guess my first point is, I don't know if we should take these categories any more seriously than we take the homo ferus and the homo monstrosus category. Now, as Gonzalez notes that afterward, Blumenbach came along and tried to kind of systematize this and make it sound a little more scientific. And from him, we get the word that some white people like to use to describe themselves. They say they're Caucasian because I guess, I don't know why people use it. I think they use that because it sounds more sciency. Yeah. Well, that's what Blumenbach believed. He was kind of fascinated with one particular skull in the Caucasus and said that that was the perfect human beings. And it was probably because that's where Noah's Ark was supposed to be found. And so they were the best Europeans. And he actually thought that the other Europeans were kind of degraded forms of the people in the Caucasus, which is in present day Georgia, the country of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. What's also interesting about this is that a lot of people within Europe kind of looked down upon the Caucasians and would think, what are you, why do you like those people for? Why do you think they're the perfect ones? But they, anyway, it's a strange terminology. And for those who think it's more scientific, it's not. So we have here Blumenbach's groups and others put people into three groups. Some people had seven groups, other people had 37 groups or 45 groups. Mickey, which one of these is right? <laughs> one, yeah. None of these is right. So this is all because you can't do it. And so the fact that all these people were measuring things and trying to group people up, biologically speaking, yes, there is human difference. There is genetic variation, physical variation, skin color variation, lactose tolerance variation, malarial resistance variation, all kinds of great human variation. It simply does not sort into groups that do anything but overlap with each other and are always interbreeding. Now, back in the 1930s, when Benedict was talking about that racial snobbery and trying to minimize the idea of race, which was pretty huge back then, and it was very entrenched. And as we'll read about, Boaz was right there too, of course. This was what happened to the people 
to Boaz and Benedict, as Charles King put it on page 13 of uh, Gods of the Upper Air, which we'll be returning to. We've read this part, but we'll be returning to it on Thursday. They were dismissed from jobs, monitored by the FBI, and hounded in the press. Which is to say, the people who were trying to fight against the racial classifications and fight for uh, people who were that people would be more culture conscious, really, a lot of them got persecuted for it, uh, or they didn't they didn't rise as far as they they should have uh, because of the the overwhelming snobbery at the time. So this was the situation in the 1930s. By the 1990s, it did seem that that point of view from anthropologies, from Boaz and Benedict and the one human race kind of people, seemed to be winning or seemed to be in ascendance, you might say. It's not that eth ethnocentrism and racism had disappeared, but it seemed like people were mellowing out about it. And one reason for that is that uh, the civil rights movement in the United States and various activists fought hard for rights and to be seen as full human beings. And Dr. Martin Luther King was someone who read and cited uh, Benedict and others uh, and were in contact with people in anthropology. Um, this is something that I think sometimes we lose sight of, or I think that our Gods of the Upper Air book lose sight of, is just the importance of people who, who were putting their bodies on the line in order to make change in their society. So it wasn't simply the scientists and the people in the academics who were doing it. But there were a couple of really good statements within anthropology about this. Uh, one of them was from Frank Livingstone, who in 1964 wrote that there are no races, there are only clines. And what he meant by that is you can't group people into these blocks of people like white and black and, and or Caucasian, whatever you want to call it, that the only thing we see when we look out at the human species is a range of variation according to geographic distribution. And if you lined everybody up from lightest to darkest, you'd have a perfect continuum of variation. This got a huge amount of support uh, by Lewinton's, Richard Lewinton's work in the early 1970s in a classic article called The Apportionment of Human Diversity. And he was one of the first to kind of grind up the human genome, the DNA from different places, and discovered that there was more diversity within any so-called race than there was between different races. And so the issue seemed pretty settled in terms of the science of that there were these biological classifications uh, were not going to work. The other thing that started to people began to think about is instead of seeing the divisions of society as biological races, people started to talk a lot more about ethnicity and cultural variation. And people began also to see ethnicity as a kind of liberatory force against the colonialism that had been in place. Gonzalez talks about this idea that people had a, an ethnic identity which deserved recognition. And around the 1990s, there was an idea that as people talked to each other and as we had these new technologies like telephones, and I'm trying to think of what we had in the 1990s. We definitely had telephones and we were starting, we had planes and we were, had televisions and things that we could see each other. We didn't have, didn't have YouTube yet, but we're getting there. The idea was that people, because they were talking to each other, because of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, that people would get to know each other and that the the hard edges, you might say, of religion and ethnicity would go away once people talk to each other more. So for the most part, since anthropology was kind of winning out there, the people who called themselves anthropologists mostly wound up in 
the academy doing teaching and writing books and they weren't didn't have to they weren't fighting these battles anymore out there they were just fighting with each other and getting all theoretical and and trying to get good jobs and write funny books and stuff we saw this a little bit i talked to you about this a while ago maybe two classes ago that in some ways, cultural anthropology was at its best when it was fighting all these stereotypes from the outsider, from a renegade position. And as anthropologists joined the academy, you have this development of all these subfields and theories and hierarchies, et cetera. So by the 1990s, things seemed strangely good. It's hard, it's hard for me to, to convey what was going on in, say, 1999 when the United States was paying down its national debt. And in fact, we we're paying down the debt so fast that some economists were like, ah, oh, you don't wanna do it that fast. It's gonna, you're gonna pay it off too fast. So maybe just slow down on the payback time. And now it's hard to imagine $24 trillion later, hard to imagine that that was what was going on. So what happened? As you know, the idea that people we're going to sort of soften the edges of religious and ethnic ideas got pretty much blown apart as other things did. And we just had the commemoration of these, uh, of these events uh, over the weekend. Now, at the time, there were some anthropologists, many anthropologists, I hope, and many diplomats and other people who said, okay, what we should do now is we should get all of our alliances together and portray the people who did this as criminals. That this should be about law, order, and public safety. And by doing that, we'll all unite together, we'll you know, empower people in order to hunt down the criminals who did these despicable acts. So that was what some people wanted to do. We didn't get that, did we? We got something else, the war on terror. And so it became, instead of criminals, it became a war. Now what happens, I mean, there's good, good parts to having a war, but what do you get? When you're having a war, what does a war do? Yeah. You rev up the nationalism. Wars usually rev up the nationalism. Oh yeah, that's why that Ruth Benedict quote came back because people were being thrown into contact with each other and the response was racial snobbery and nationalism. Wars usually rev up the nationals. What else do wars do? The ideas of wars. What do you get if you call something a war? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, the, obviously police violence is a, is a problematic thing, but usually when you're at war, you can... <laughs> You, you, have a, you have a certain amount of even more you can do, right? You're just rolling in. Yes, uh, uh, there's usually more. Mickey. Uh, all's, all's, fair, all's fair in love and war. You, a lot of things get justified in wars that, you know, you wouldn't, you don't do in peacetime. You get wartime powers, right? The whole idea of having different uh, codes of law during a war. Yeah. Yeah. So the revs up the nationalism, the us and the them. There's something else that if you call something a war, you can usually get from people. Yeah. It's a good way to spend a lot of money, right? We talked about paying down the debt. Now we'll just rev up the military and rev up the debt. Now I'm not trying to say that this was wrong. I'm just trying to say that this was an approach that people used and it didn't necessarily have to be that approach. The reason a lot of people are 
The reason so many anthropologists and diplomats argued against this approach also is if you say you're at war with somebody, what does that do to the people on the other side of the war? Hmm? War back. And in some ways, it makes them bigger than they are, right? <laughs> it makes them into heroes. Now they're fighting a war. Now they're the people fighting the, the, the enemy, right? So, you know, the language, I'm not saying the language of criminality is always a good one. That has its, all, its own problems. But if you want to go to war, you have to watch your metaphors because people, people get crazy. Now, given that we were at war, a lot of the ideas about race and ethnicity also came into question that idea that anthropology had sort of won the, won the battle, won the war on race, got turned back around. So up until 2001, I think a lot of people accepted the idea that race is a social construction, not a biological reality. But after 2001, a lot of people said, no, race is, race is, not, is, is more different than a social construct. Now, from my point of view, a lot of the people who said, ah, race is just a social construct, those people are crazy, it's much more, misunderstood the idea of social construct. When anthropologists and others said that race is a social construct, that doesn't mean that we're in any way denying that there is variation, that there is genetic diversity, that biology matters. It's simply saying that it can't be grouped, biologically speaking, into meaningful categories and that the categories that we construct, we build are social ones. When we say something as a social construction, we can do this with say gender too, that means it's a very real idea. It has real effects in the world. It doesn't mean it's just something we've made up in our heads and we're goofing around. So social construction means it's very real. And it also means it's very social. Um, so a lot of people, when they say something like race is a social construct, they think it means they can be whatever they want to be. And it doesn't really work like that. So Gonzalez gives us a couple interesting examples on page 62. Uh, from Dr. Kim Tallbear talking about the, uh, the, the genetic ancestry tests and people who want to claim to be indigenous from those tests. She says, uh, Dr. Tallbear says that is, so it's not just a matter of what you claim, but it's a matter of who claims you. So it's not just who you claim to be, it's who, what's the social group who is claiming you? And then later on, she talks about in the section, uh, Gonzalez talks about, can you become black? About uh, the person who, who basically was saying that she was African-American. Um, again, here, this is part of a social grouping. It's not simply, it's not that your individual choices don't matter, but it, there's a social aspect to that. So, I think there was a, I think in general, when people say race is a social construct, it's, it's often misunderstood to be something that it's not. It is very real. It's, there's still obviously biology still exists. It just means that our social stuff is important. The other thing that happened since 2001 is that for some reason, forensic anthropology got very popular and people would come in with a bone and say, aha, Let's go find the criminal, it's a white guy. Um, and we could go over, this is not a biological anthropology class, we could go over why we can make an analysis of skeletal remains, and we can talk about ancestry percentages and ancestry estimations and how they might translate into race, um, or racial classifications in today's world. Um, basically, I'll just say that, uh, the ability of forensic anthropologists to analyze ancestry does not validate the idea of biological race. 
The other thing that's happened is that ancestry companies say that they can swab your DNA and tell you if you're 18% Irish and 32% I don't know, what else do I want? Italian, French, all those things. Um, as again, I won't get into the numbers of this, but if you just do your genetics back 25 generations or so, or a thousand years back, you'll find that you have many, many, many ancestries. And so again, both of these things have to do with uh, entertainment value of, of being able to qualify your money. The other thing that has happened is that politically speaking, it's been very ad ad advantageous for politicians, and that's happened here and in other places to stir up this idea of ethno-nationalism or encourage people to identify as a certain race or ethnicity. So, recap. From the 1930s, if you remember, when some of the anthropologists were speaking against the idea of race and ethnocentrism. They really got persecuted for that. We'll read more about that in, in, uh, in Gods of the Upper Air. By the 1990s, we kind of had a had a had it tamped down a little bit. We were winning on that. And then since about 2000. One, which is why it interested me that so many of you put this quote in in the 2000s, uh, there's been this revival of race and ethnic ideas. Now the question, or one question is, is, well, what do we do? Should we in anthropology and elsewhere just bring back cultural relativism, those ideas from the 1930s of being culturally conscious? This will actually be one of your potential essay topics for, uh, I'll give you those in a couple of days for your first essay. You could write about, should we, to what extent are these ideas, do we just bring them back from the 1930s if that's the kind of ethnocentrism that we're seeing? Um, a lot of anthropologists did. Like I said, I started teaching Ruth Benedict's book around 2004, early 2000s. And a lot of anthropologists put this up on their Facebook page or their Facebook background, which is something that Ruth Benedict may have actually said at one point. I haven't actually been able to locate whether she wrote this down or not, but close enough. I mean, she had this idea for sure, which is that the purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. So. Uh, in some ways, like I said, a lot of the patterns of culture, Ruth Benedict's book got republished several times in the 2000s. So a lot of anthropologists felt like they needed to take up the cultural relativism claim again. So I think that's a decent idea. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but I think that we need to, uh, we need to enhance our thinking on that. So what I've drawn up here in this next part of class are kind of seven lessons for how I think using the textbook and using anthropology, we might try to use these ideas, but adapt them to the world we're living in. The first lesson is that when it comes to ideas of race and ethnicity and ethnocentrism and racism, it's more than simply using different words, different terminology, and it's even more than changing the way people think about the world. And that's why in the last class, I thought it was so important that we look at the parts of culture as not just what we think, think, but also as what we do and as what we have. Because in some ways, simply changing the way people talk about race or the way people think about ethnicity didn't address what is called systemic or structural racism, which is more about what people have their material position in life 
and the advantages and disadvantages that people have in different parts of society. So one measure of structural racism, for example, is the wealth difference, the average wealth difference between whites and blacks in the United States, which by various measures is something like 12 to 20 times as much in terms of wealth differences that you're starting out with. And so there's a wealth gap, which actually has not changed and may even have, have increased since the 1960s, since the civil rights movement. So although some of the terms have changed and although hopefully the way we act with each other has changed, a lot of the systems and the structures are still embedded in our society. And so this is one, I think, lesson about uh, how we apply cultural relativism in today's world, that it's not simply necessarily a matter of educating people. Benedict and Boaz believe fervently that if you simply educated people, they would change. And there has been change, but that doesn't necessarily address the systemic racism of our society. The other thing that I think we need to understand better is uh, what we might call the biological consequences of racism. Actually, Nick, you talked about this a little bit. What happens to people? Um, there was a little uh, slide thought was really interesting that uh, in the book that social and cultural experiences can have a direct effect on a person's sense of health. Um, I just thought it was really interesting that um, there's a made a connection between the two. Um, between racism and um, how a person can almost be um, how it's not really uh, not really physical health, but who they can become and like what their potential like future is just because of like what they experience when they're younger. Yeah, actually, I would go with physical health. <laughs> Don't shy away from it. I think that in some ways, and this is, is extremely important, like, so the early anthropologists very much tried to separate culture from biology in some ways because people were trying to claim that biology determined culture, and so they wanted to separate those two. But it's very important to understand that the things that we believe and that we do have biological implications. If I have 10 times as much money as you, I'm going to be able to get better health care. That's what you talked about here in this country, right? My school is probably going to be better. Probably, you know, things are going to be generally better for me. Uh, the anthropologist Clarence Gravely has talked about this as how race becomes biology. So the idea is that we have these ideas and there's behaviors and especially the systemic racism and those things become part of people's lives their stress levels their maternal health the access to education and health care and these kinds of things start to become a physical or, or physically manifest there's a really kind of amazing study that was done uh, that gonzalez talks about about the birth weights of people with Arab surnames in the United States in Los Angeles after September 11th. And here was a population that really, I mean, it's, it's not like they didn't face discrimination, but the discrimination really revved up. And she was looking at uh, our, it wasn't Gonzalez, it was, um, our researcher, Diane Lauderdale. Uh, Professor Lauderdale was looking at what happened to the birth weights of people who were all of a sudden in some way subjected to uh, different kinds of, uh, of, of ethnic slurs, discrimination. Um, and she found that they, they're actually their birth, the infant birth weights declined after that. They were, they were uh, in comparison to pre-9-11. And again, this is in Los Angeles, which was not not at all near where this stuff took place. So we can see this in various ways that having that, that ethnocentrism and racism can have 
uh, biological consequences. One of the other lessons that I think is very important is that we often think about racism as simply being mean or discriminating or being prejudiced against other people. Francis, what else goes on? Hmm? What else is race about? It's not just me being mean. Getting more opportunities than other people, yeah. The idea here that Gonzalez discusses of white privilege is that people are born with unearned privileges. Now these days, the idea of white privilege has become kind of, it used to just make people upset. Now it's kind of made fun of. Uh, Gonzalez cites uh, John Scalzi, who wrote a really interesting blog post about 10 years ago in 2012, where he tried to put this into different language for those of us who kind of bristle at the word privilege. And as he put it, being a straight white male means you're playing the game of life at the lowest difficulty setting. You have it here. Now, what he said at the beginning of this article was that, sure, privilege actually is a fine word to use, but since straight white males don't like that word and they react to it in a weird way, he wanted to put this in a different way that they could understand so they wouldn't be quibbling with it so much. This blog post became viewed by uh, he actually recently did a follow-up to this uh, in 2022, 10 years later. It became one of the, his biggest hits. So uh, some people want to know, well, how, how, do you, how do you talk to people who don't want to talk about race to others? You might take a look at this. It's kind of been an interesting uh, idea. So he revisited this 10 years later in 2022, and he said, it's basically correct. 10 years later, the lowest difficulty setting still applies. It's as relevant as ever. And I'm sure a bunch of straight white men will maintain it's still not accurate. As they would have been in 2012, they're entire, entirely wrong. And that's, and what a privilege that is to be completely wrong and yet suffer no consequences for it. So anyway, I would recommend, he's definitely not an anthropologist, just a person who knows how to write pretty well and is a straight white male himself and so maybe can get through if you're interested in that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an important concept about race. That said, I also think that there's an important lesson that just because you might, I might have white privilege, that doesn't mean that our whole society doesn't, hasn't suffered because of, uh, because of our, our, our own racism. And this, uh, a, in a recent book by Heather McGee called The Sum of Us, which is now uh, being turned into a podcast, you can listen to it instead of, instead of reading it. Um, McGee writes about the idea of what racism costs everyone. And she uses a, 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 obviously from the cover of this book, this is a, this is a swimming pool. She uses the example of swimming pools in this country, which all these cities and towns used to have these beautiful swimming pools, beautiful public swimming pools. And a lot of them in the 1960s were told that they had to desegregate the swimming pool. That you couldn't just have only white people in your swimming pool. And they'd have these beautiful swimming pools, but many of the towns decided that instead of desegregating the swimming pool, they were just going to fill it up with sand. No swimming pool, nobody gets to swim. And so what she says is, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we do things? Why can't we have good things? A lot of people think the same thing about having a national health care system. 
And whenever we try to do it, run straight up against the idea that some people are going to benefit more than else, others. So I would, again, recommend get a chance to read or listen to that podcast. Really super interesting stuff. The other lesson is about this idea of ethnicity and how people think of ethnicity. So a lot of people, when they use the word ethnicity or a culture group, they think that the people within that ethnic group are all kind of the same, all kind of homogeneous. They think that people in ethnic groups are just stuck in time. They don't change, that they have their traditions. We often talk about ethnic groups as being bounded and having these boundaries or being isolated for each, from each other. And that the people that are part of these groups are the way they are because of their culture. Well, you know how those people are, it's their culture. That's what makes them the way they are and they're all the same. Now, if that's what you think about certain people in a certain group, what, huh? I had a better way to ask this question, but I don't know how to ask it. If that's what you think about people, you might as well just use the same old term of race, which is to say, that's what the race idea was all about, was lumping people together as homogeneous tradition determined by bounded, isolated units. And that's why in the last class, I was so insistent that we think about culture as heterogeneous, variable, changing and dynamic, interconnected and always in contact and something that people discuss and think about and are always changing. Big lesson here is that, up to number five, that just changing the words around doesn't necessarily solve how people think about each other and how they behave. Perhaps it doesn't, it's not good to use, use bad words about people, but it doesn't necessarily change anything if you have the same idea and are using ethnic terms instead of racial ones. So, Again, going back to the idea that we need to have, see culture as dynamic and interconnected and not just replicating those old uh, racial ideas. Why do we want to watch out for cultural appropriation, Taylor? What is that? The damage that is designed to like that ideas and their business groups that are totally oppressed. Um, basically, you don't want to do that because it's rude as well. And it can really hurt someone's feelings, and it's just not appropriate. Like, that's someone's culture. Like, why would you even want to do that? Disrespectful. You can appreciate culture, you don't want to appropriate it. Yeah. Felicia, you said you agreed completely with that. I mean, yeah, I do. Some cultures, some things in cultures are very important, so not appropriate culture. You want to appreciate culture, find some things like that that are offensive and they're offensive and try to understand what the culture means before you actually listen. Yeah, I mean, this takes some education, right? This takes some people have to educate themselves, but you know, I think you can figure it out. You'll know, you know it when you see it. Yeah, I think a lesson, I think, seventh lesson is that these ideas and uh, discrimination, racism, ethnocentrism, as we'll throw in sexism, 
occurs along multiple dimensions, what we now call intersectionality. But there's different aspects to this that come up in, in various ways. Brady, you talked about caste. Let me get from that. Yeah, so caste system is basically uh, it's separated by uh, social class, and there's basically discrimination to those who are a lower class than higher. So this is kind of the same concept of discrimination of race, but it's not uh, by skin color, but it is you're born into it and you can't change it. And yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting. There's there's a pretty recent book that actually talks about. We usually use caste to refer to systems on, on the uh, the Asian the S South Asian subcontinent. There's these uh, as Brady has told us systems in which you're born into a certain occupational class, but a lot of people over the years have wondered to what extent here in the United States, some of the same ideas and concepts might apply. And again, this is not necessarily a perfect analogy, but it, it can be worth thinking about to what degree some of these things might be uh, useful in how we think about our own society and some of the uh, race ethnicity alignments that we have here as well. So it's a, it's an, it's, it's an interesting idea to be, uh, to be put together with what's going on. The other idea that I want to bring up from this section, which also Gonzalez uses this uh, in India as well about the categories of, of skin color, but it happens in many parts of the world, including the United States, is the idea that the, the fairer skinned, even within a particular group have a kind of advantage, or I mean, are advantaged in terms of their life prospects. And um, actually we do this, although we don't talk about it much in the United States as well. If you look at sort of psychological studies of how people view uh, people who might have lighter skin, but fall into the black category versus people that have darker skin, but are also in, in the black category and the ways in which uh, how they are treated both within their own communities as well as outside of it. Um, it's part of a kind of multi-dimensional idea of, of race and ethnicity that we need to uh, take part in. So going back to the first question, should we just bring back cultural relativism? I guess it's better than nothing. It's better than not saying anything at all. It's better than just sticking it out in your in academia, but we need to kind of, we need to update it to today's world. Um, and many of the people I have cited here and that Gonzalez cites are actually writing from outside of anthropology. So for, at least for me, there's a need to get more in touch with what's going on out there. Uh, the old fashioned cultural relativism is better than nothing but it definitely needs, uh, needs some adjustment in order to work in today's world. 